everybody. How are you? Good. So, <clears throat> my name's Clayton Flesher. Um, I've been coding for a few years. I've been getting paid to do it for a couple years. Um, this didn't exist when I came up, so you guys are lucky, uh, and it's awesome. Uh, but I'm going to talk to you about, so I work for a company called Hague Software, and one of the things we do is DevOps consulting, and that's a very scary concept for a lot of people, so I'm going to give you guys some, like, ideas of what DevOps is, because uh, it's a conversation you'll end up having in the industry, and not a lot of people know what it is who've been doing coding for a long time, so this is going to give you uh, a nice... Uh, readiness for having the conversation. Uh, before we start, I want to uh, point out something I discovered recently that would have been helpful for me when I was getting started, and it'll be helpful for you. There's this really good cloud podcast called Base CS Podcast. Uh, one of the hosts is Saran Yitbarak, who runs the Code Newbie organization, um, which you should also be checking out. That bottom link is the link to their Slack channel. It's a really great place to like go on there and talk to other people in a Slack channel from all over the world who are also learning to code. And also there are people like me who used to be learning the language who uh, can answer questions now. Okay, some caveats before we get too deep into this. Uh, so this is new stuff to a lot of people who've been coding for a long time. Um, it's a wide ranging subject. I'm still learning a lot of this stuff too. Um, I've never used a few some of the tools I'm going to talk about today, but I'll try to mention when that's the case because I just want you to be aware that they exist. And I am not a front end developer. I learned Ruby and ran as hard and fast away from the front end as I could, and I'm still pretty far from it, uh, which is actually how I ended up with the job I have because this is not front end development. But it's stuff you need to be you need to know about because you're going to interact with it in the industry. So, what is DevOps? So we has anyone ever heard of a sysadmin? Yeah, I got a few people. Do you have any sysadmins in the room? Sort of. You're more of a are you a systems in, operations engineer? Is that more descriptive of what you are? A little bit of everything. So, system operations engineers, sysadmins, they're the people who hate the developers at most uh, enterprise organizations. Uh, I would regularly hear the uh, sysadmins yell over the cubicle wall, expletive, expletive developers when they broke something on their servers. Um, but they're the people who make the servers of the company run, make the servers of the company be configured. And they're very important and you should be nice to them and try not to piss them off. And then there's you guys, what you're trying to be as a developer. You make the applications that they're going to deploy onto the organization's IT infrastructure. So what is DevOps? DevOps is a set of practices and tools that help the systems operations people and the developers work better together and make IT more responsive. Basically making it where you can develop applications more quickly, get them deployed more quickly, and uh, not uh, hate each other. So there's some core concepts in DevOps you need to at least have a 10,000 foot view about. We'll get into the details on them a little bit, but I'm at least going to throw the ideas in there. Has anyone ever in here heard of Agile? Okay, good. So if you work in the industry, you've definitely heard of Agile. If you are getting into the industry, you will hear about Agile. Um, we'll talk a little bit more details about it in a minute. Uh, infrastructure is code. Who, knows, who here knows, has heard of that idea before? Awesome. So to be fair, I went to Thunder Plains, which is a room full of JavaScript developers, and I said, all right, everybody who knows what infrastructure as code is, raise your hand, and about 25% of the room raised their hand. And those are people who are paid JavaScript developers going to conferences. So this concept's new to a lot of people. We'll talk about what it is and what some of the tools are. Continuous integration. Yeah, we'll get into details. Continuous delivery and monitoring. These are some... These are the, the things that make DevOps go. So Agile. Uh, so DevOps has its roots in uh, the Agile movement, which began in 2001 with this thing called the Agile Manifesto. It was a bunch of guys who had been working in IT forever and a day, 
realized it was broken, wrote a big, like, communist manifesto for developers and uh, tried to and tra fundamentally change the in transform the industry. It comes from this idea, if you've ever worked in manufacturing, there's this idea that came out in the 90s called lean, which says, like, um, you know, find the bottleneck in your organization, uh, find the thing that's causing the, the, the stops and get rid of it. It's, it basically completely changed how uh, the US, but I think it was Japan that actually came up with it first, uh, does the car manufacturing and then it was spread to all manufacturing. That's why manufacturing today doesn't look like anything like it did in the 80s. Um, and then the four core concepts of Agile is individuals and interactions over processes and tools. I'm not gonna get into any details on this, I'm just giving you the ideas. Working software over uh, comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, and responding to change over following a plan. Those four core concepts got broken out into, into 12 bullet points, which I'm gonna blow through really quick. Um, customer satisfaction by, uh, by early and continuous delivery of valuable software. Welcoming change requirements, even late in development. If anybody who's worked in a big enterprise company, that sounds insane to them. Uh, working software is delivered frequently, week, in weeks rather than in months. Uh, close daily cooperation between business developers, business people and developers. So getting the business people in the room with the people who are making the stuff they're gonna use, which sounds like, well, yeah, but I literally had a conversation with a guy last week who was like, the business people don't know what they need. So these ideas are still getting adopted and, and, and accepted in the industry. Um, projects are built around motivated individuals who should be trusted. Face-to-face -face conversations important. I know we all wanna work remote, but you get more done if you're actually in the room with other developers. Um, working software is the primary measure of progress. Uh, my boss, Ryan Haig, argues with this one and he will love to have a long lunch conversation with you about why this is wrong. Um, sustainable development, able to maintain a constant pace. I am gonna blow through the last few. Simplicity is important. Um, Self-organize your teams and make sure that you, your team, after you're done working on your project, gets around and says what happened, what worked, what didn't in a blameless environment. So this is agile. This sounds nothing like what I was talking about before with like system admins and developers and getting them to work together. But if you, uh, this, these concepts have been adapted pretty heavily in the development world. A lot of DevOps is getting the systems people to be a part of these kinds of conversations that you're having to have in development and making tools to make those conversations easier. So infrastructure is code. This is the thing that I did a, a, a lightning talk at Thunder Plains about. Uh, it's totally new to a lot of people. I actually had a really good conversation with Daniel Ashcraft about this concept on Friday. Um, so like literally it's really recent. The tools that are getting developed for infrastructure as code have been out for a couple of years at the most. Um, so it says, hey, we have this thing called a data center, which is all of our servers. Um, what if it gets hit by a tornado and we need to rebuild it tomorrow? And that's when all your system admin people are like, well, that's like, why we have offsite backups and all this stuff. But and they're like, well, how long is that going to take? And they're like, I don't know. We hope it never happens. Infrastructure as code is literally, oh, our server's down. Boom, 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 boom. Hey, we got a server back. That's infrastructure as code. Um, it says, hey, our data center is going to be stored in Git in version control. So, like, not only your application gets stored in version control, but everything that you need to get your servers back is also stored in, Git, in a Git repository somewhere. Uh, to, and you say how to tear down and rebuild all of your organization's servers. And it's made possible because of cloud infrastructure. Like, this is really hard to do in what's called on-prem or on-premises, but... That's why we have things like AWS, Google Cloud Platform, Azure. These are all things you'll run into someday because they're the future of our industry. And uh, so let's talk about the core concepts of infrastructure as code. Standing up and provisioning a server. In other words, giving me a server I didn't have before, giving me the network that the server lives on. 
uh, configuration management, which is not the same thing as standing up and provisioning a server. Standing up and provisioning a server says, I didn't have something, type some stuff, hit go, and now I have servers that live in the cloud or something. Configuration management is something that periodically talks to those servers and says, hey, you should have this version of this thing installed upon you, or you need to update this version of this thing, and it, over time, checks in with those servers, or those servers check in with it to make sure that they don't need to make changes and get, get their changes. There's a, we'll go into what, what some of these tools that do this are. Um, core concept in, is declarative versus imperative. I'm not gonna get into the weeds on this. I just want you to know that these are ideas out there. Declarative says, I tell you what resources I wanna have out in the world, and you figure out how to get them. The tool I'm using figures out how to get there. Imperative is a lot like what you guys are doing with you type code, where you say, start at the top of the file, read to the bottom of the file, and do everything in that order. When I have function references, go get those functions and do that behavior. Declarative is a lot more like SQL. Has anybody, anybody in here run into SQL yet? SQL, you say, go get everything from this table that matter, matches these patterns and give it to me. That's declarative code. Well, one of the core concepts in uh, infrastructure as code is declarative architecture. You say, I'm going to define in a code base what my system looks like. I hit the go button, and it figures out how to get all that stuff. And we just like SQL figures out how to get it from the database. And I don't have to tell it, go hit this row, see if it matches, then go hit this row and see if it matches, and then go hit this row. Just give me the resources. There's a concept of push versus pull models. Push models are, um, I have somewhere that I tell all my servers that live out in the world. Um, I broadcast a message to my servers and say, go install this stuff on you. Uh, if I want to make changes, I do it again. I push changes to the servers that already exist. Pull is, I have servers that live out in the world. And I have another server that is in charge of configuration. And my servers that live out in the world, every 30 minutes or so, check in with that server and say, hey, do I need to make any changes? If so, I pull those changes to me and, and make those changes. Um, I'm not getting into the details on how all this works. I'm just telling you these are concepts that exist. Uh, and then the last one is item bones. Can, uh, I can run my script that builds my stuff or makes my changes on my servers first, and it makes those changes, and then I can immediately run it again, and again, and again, and again, and I get exactly the same results every time as I got the first time I ran it. That's what item potence means. It just means it's safe to run my script over and over again without having to worry about um, my, the, there being a new instance, a new thing created every time. So, that's really important if you have a, a pool model that says, hey, my server checks in every 30 minutes and runs this configuration script, and I don't have to worry about the fact that every time 30 minutes from now, I'm gonna have something different than I had before if I don't want that. Okay, so what are some of the tools that do this for us? Uh, infrastructure as code, we have Terraform. Uh, it runs for AWS, Azure, it works with DigitalOcean. Do we have any Heroku people in here? Anybody who's used Heroku for anything? It works with Heroku. Uh, it works with Google Cloud Platform. We had the Google people in here in this room on Friday telling everybody why they should use Google Cloud for everything. Um, you can use Terraform with that. This is the AWS specific version of that it's called cloud formation so if your company is like we're all in on AWS why you would ever be all in on one platform I can't say but if your company is all in on AWS for your infrastructure cloud formation is the tool for you Azure has Azure Resource Manager same thing I just said about AWS applies so who here has ever heard of AWS do you know what I'm talking about okay for those who don't it's called Amazon Web Services it's this really cool thing that lets you build servers in the sky um, Azure is the Microsoft version of that. They're the, uh, hey, we could do it too. 
Um, they're a lot smaller, they have a lot less people using them, but which is weird because everyone thinks like Microsoft is eating the world, but no, Amazon Web Services by far has eaten the world in this world, this area. There's also a Google Cloud version of it, I think, but I don't I haven't messed with it. And then you can also do this kind of declarative give me my stuff out in the world with these tools called Chef, Ansible, and Puppet. That's not what they're intended for. You shouldn't use them for this. But I'm making it be aware that they exist. We'll talk a little bit more about them in a minute. Yes, yes, it does exist in, in, uh, in uh, Ansible is a thing in the Ender's game books. Um, chef, uh, so configuration management, so provisioning is how I get my stuff in the world. Configuration management is how do I maintain it, keep it going. One of the common tools for that is Chef. It's a, what's called a Ruby domain specific language. It means it's written in Ruby. It looks a lot like Ruby. If you know Ruby, you'll be comfortable with this. Um, and it's the pool model. It says, I have a server. It's called a Chef server. <sighs> Ruby people like to give things weird names. So Chef, all of the things you write in Chef are called cookbooks. Cookbooks have recipes. It has automated test suites called a test kitchen. Um, Ruby people are cute that way. What can I say? Uh, but Chef. Chef is fun. I use it all the time because, like I said at the beginning of my talk, I come from the Ruby world, and I'm really comfortable writing code with this stuff. It looks sane to me. Um, Ansible. So it's the Python, or one of the Python versions of this. Uh, it's a Python DSL. It's a push model. I can't talk much about Ansible because this is the first tool I've mentioned specifically up here that I haven't had a lot of experience with. Um, Puppet, I have zero experience with. It's another Ruby DSL. It's also a pull model. It's an alternative to Chef. People get in long. So you guys argue about like Angular versus React. The DevOps people argue about this stuff. That's just so you know, like that's a thing. And then Salt Stack, um, it's another Python one. I believe it's push and pull, according to the internet. Um, so I run a meetup called DevOps OKC. We have a guy coming in from Tulsa to talk about this in December. If you're interested in learning a little bit more about configuration management in general, particularly a tool that neither one of us knows anything about, come to that talk, meetup.com slash DevOps OKC. Uh, OK, continuous integration. This is the next core concept in DevOps. I am seeing eyes glaze over. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, OK, so it's a set of tools and practices that help speed up development uh, cycles and help developers to get code to master branch as quickly as possible. So OK, have any of you ever used Circle CI, Travis CI, any of the stuff that exists on GitHub? I've seen more hands. I've seen more hands. These are guys who are developers. You're gonna to wanna to use this stuff. Basically it is, hey, I push code to GitHub, which you're all gonna do, right? We're all pushing our code to GitHub or storing it in a Git repository. It's a thing that says, hey, when I push my code to GitHub, it goes, hey, you pushed code to GitHub. Grab code. You're writing automated tests because you're a good person. Um, I'm gonna run those tests and see if they pass. If they pass, I do something like, send you a message in your Slack channel. Hey, your build passed, you're a good person. Or, hey, your build failed, go figure out why, here's your stack trace. That's uh, automated CI, that's the dead simplest version of it. Um, but there are, it gets fun and complicated. Um, so to make CI work, continuous integration to CI, you have to have your code in a repository with version control. So everyone here is going to learn GitHub because it's free and by default public. Odds are at your company you won't be using GitHub, um, especially if you're at a large enterprise company. You'll probably be using Bitbucket or GitLab because by default they're private and uh, it costs money on GitHub to be public. And uh, Bitbucket is part of something called the Atlassian stack, which is like uh, we have our own version of Slack. We have our ver own version of ticketing. Everything's easily integrated with each other. A lot of companies use Bitbucket. It all works the same. If you learn Git and GitHub, you know how to use this stuff. You're going to be fine. Um, it has automated builds. 
So I mentioned, you pushed code to your repository. I noticed you pushed code to your repository, I being your CI server. Um, I'm gonna automatically take your code and build it. <clears throat> so for the JavaScript people, you're like, builds, what are those? Um, for the Java world, that means something else entirely. It is, hey, I'm gonna take your code and compile it using something like Maven or something like that. I'm gonna take your code and compile it and take, make an artifact out of your code that can be used and deployed somewhere because code's made into binaries in that world. Um, but for the Ruby people, for the Python people, literally just means I'm gonna run your, I'm gonna take your, 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 your code and I'm gonna run it through some tests. But, uh, so you have automated tests. Automated builds and automated tests, for most of you guys, those are the same thing. Uh, another continuous integration thing that, thing that makes that possible is everyone's committing to master or something like master every day, which uh, I'm seeing a few people go, hmm, uh, we don't do that. Uh, that is a contingent concept out there. Uh, my boss started a Twitter fight like three weeks ago that turned into a whole mess because like Jesse Harlan, which I know for a fact has been in front of you guys, is like, that's a terrible idea. And like people got into an argument about it. So uh, continuous integration, the, the, the people who are like the big thought people in, in CI argue for this. Um, Keep your build fast. In other words, don't make it forever to run your tests. So, do you know, have you guys run into the concept of unit tests and integration tests yet? No? Okay. There are these things that exist. Unit tests are tests that test little bits of your code, happen really fast. You fake out anything that they need to, uh, like any dependencies, like they don't actually have to hit a real database. They don't actually have to go out and hit whatever API you're using. They just fake out all that data, they run really fast, and they just test that your code does what your code's supposed to do. It doesn't test that like the API that you're pulling in actually exists out in the world. Unit tests are fast by their nature. Integration tests are, I'm gonna pretend, I'm gonna write a program that pretends to click here and waits three seconds and then does this and runs through all throughout your application and take, those tests tend to be highly, they're, they're integrated, they're coupled together, they make sure your entire application works. You don't wanna have a ton of integration tests because they make your, your builds run slow. Um, you'll find if you have a big, large code base, if you're some big company, integration tests are gonna be your nightmare, you're gonna hate them. If you hate your unit tests, it's because they're not really unit tests and you need to start using mocks. Um, you'll learn what all these things mean later. Um, Tests in a clone of the production environment. So your test environment is, uh, so you're not running your tests on a Windows server and then deploying to a Linux server, or even better, testing your stuff in, um, well, that's like the worst of all possible worlds I can think of, but like we're running our tests on Ubuntu 12.04 and we're deploying onto a server that's running Ubuntu 14.04. Like you're making sure that, and also that our test environment has like these 40 other things installed on it because we have to test all this other stuff on the same environment. Like the whole idea is your test environment is exactly the same as the environment your, your production is running on. It has all the same stuff installed on it. And that way, if something breaks, you know that it's not the environment that's the problem. And then everyone gets to see the results of the latest build. You guys can all go to some place and see what happened and why. That's really helpful. But yeah, it actually has to be said. And then, last but not least, if it gets through all the steps in your testing, it actually gets pushed out into production. That's super dangerous to some companies, but if you're doing things right and you're following a good bunch of good CI practices, you're like, you're like yeah, push it to production. I don't care, it's gonna be fine. <laughs> so there's some advantages to doing this, actually, helps your company's security practices if you're doing CI because, so I had a conversation with a client this week because I was out on site with a client in Utah last week where they were like, we don't really have a CI pipeline and um, you know, we're, we want to all be able to, the stuff we're building, we want to be able to go push it out into the, into 
out into the world and, and be able to test it ourselves. Uh, some of this, like we're building a bunch of APIs that can talk to one another, and um, we need everybody to have the ability to push code, to not just push code to the repository, but actually push the build, the build application out onto a server. And their sysadmins are like, no, you're bad people, we hate you. Your security practice, that's like insane security, we're never gonna let that happen. And so if you have a CI pipeline, in other words, if you have a continuous integration tool, the CI pipeline has the credentials it needs to do that. And it automatically, when you push code to your repository, it says, hey, you made changes, run the test. Hey, test pass. I'm going to put this into a development environment where your developers can go do stuff to it. But your developers like don't need to be actually able to log into that server. They don't need to have any kind of credentials other than the credentials they need to like hit the application's endpoints. So like helps security. It's one way that the sysadmin people can go to sleep at night and you guys can actually test your code. Um, and then it also lets you do think, take advantage of things like Docker. You're gonna hear about Docker if you haven't already. Um, it's helpful. Like some people who are my close personal friends think it's like this evil thing in the end of the world. They're wrong. Um, I have other people who are close personal friends who think it's like the panacea and solves all their problems. They're also wrong. It's a good tool, it helps you. So we talked before about making sure that your environment is the same in dev and production and all that. Containerization helps that because literally you build the environment that you're deploying at, your application into at the same time that you deploy the application. And you don't have like an entire server just for your one application. You can, you can just say, hey, Docker, take my application. My application only lives in Docker. My tests will be run only in Docker. Everything lives together in exactly the same world. Anyway, it's a thing. Continuous delivery, I'm gonna blow through this real quick. Uh, it's a way to develop software that ensures this deployed, can be deployed at any time. It takes advantage of your CI pipeline to make it possible to deploy software automatically. It leads to reliable releases and shorter time to market. It makes your business people at your company happy. We're all writing code because somebody's paying us to. That means they, in theory, want to get something, like if we work at Sonic or whatever, the Sonic business people are like, hey, uh, we wanna try this new cool thing. Can you build us an app to do that? And if you tell them, yeah, it'll be out in six months, they're gonna be like, yeah, we're not gonna do that. Cause like, it's gonna cost us however much, quarter million dollars and it might, market might have changed by then. But if you can do this, well, you can say, well, when, as soon as I push my code, it's going to try to build a deployable artifact. We might not actually deploy it within a week or two, but we're going to have to keep trying to get that stuff out there into some world that you can test your markets with. Then they're much more likely to come to you with things they want to try. Uh, keys to successful continuous deployment. Have visibility around your CI pipeline. Make sure that it lets you know when something goes wrong and keep deploying constantly. Uh, so here's some tools for that. So these are the tools you're gonna run into first. Travis CI, Circle CI, GitLab pipelines, Bitbucket pipelines. Uh, Travis and Circle, I think, are both free to use, yes? And they're, they integrate really well with GitHub. So um, as soon as you guys start learning about testing, you're gonna wanna integrate your projects with these first two here. Um, they're, it's just, yeah, write tests, take advantage of these. They'll help you be, they'll actually help you write better code in the long run. And then if you're on a big enterprise company who has money to throw around, you're going to end up running into Jenkins, Bamboo, TeamCity, and Concourse. These all get hosted on their own server. Um, Jenkins is my personal favorite. I've had a little bit of experience with Bamboo. I have zero experience with TeamCity. I think you've had some experience with it, so if you want to ask. Um, and then Concourse, I have enough experience with it to know I don't like it. Um, so anyway, uh, monitoring, last but not least. Monitoring, uh, monitoring is kind of is two things. One, it says, hey, I have this application. I built health checks into my application, so that's that you might keep in mind as you're building your apps is can my is there some server somewhere that can hit 
this endpoint on my application to know like my application is actually up and running. Um, so like and and or my application some some resource that my application needs is available. So uh, that the health checks are a useful tool. They can integrate with your, uh, your with, a, with a bunch of other monitoring tools. And then uh, making dashboards around your application and server logs. So you guys don't need to worry about this when you're first learning to code, but when you're actually like people are paying you to write code, they're gonna care a lot about how you're logging and what you're logging, especially your sysadmins, because they're gonna be the guy that's like, hey, it's four in the morning and we ran this periodically weekly test and for some reason um, now this one app is spitting out tens of thousands of log files a minute and we can't figure out why. Putting dashboards around that stuff that's useful, having consistent rules around how you log stuff. Okay, like right there at the end. A couple of tools for this, one is called Splunk. You don't really need to know anything about it other than it exists. It costs a lot of money. If you work at a company that uh, can afford it, awesome. You probably make decent money. Uh, Elkstack is a open source alternative. It's actually three things, Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. The reason it's three things is because it's open source, which means it's a big pain or, bigger pain in the butt to get set up and running. Hopefully none of you ever have to set it up, but it can help, help you debug your apps if you have a company that's using it. Some additional resources to know about. DevOpsBootCamp.osl.org is a free uh, curriculum from a company or from a, from a university that is putting out a free DevOps bootcamp that gets you from like where you guys are to ready to have your first job in the industry doing this kind of stuff. Um, and it's all of their curriculum for that. Uh, it's going to walk you through a lot of stuff you're already learning in here anyway, like Git, that kind of stuff. But it's going to also introduce a lot of concepts you won't run into in here. Uh, there's a book called The Phoenix Project. It's not free, but if you really want to read it, I can probably get a copy for you. Um, it's a, actually a novel. You can get it on Audible if you have an Audible account. That's how accessible it is. Like most developer books that you're ever going to hear about in a talk, it's like, here's this textbook. It'll never be an audio book because that makes zero sense. This is a novel uh, about uh, a company who has this project called The Phoenix Project. Uh, their head of IT gets fired because the project's overdue and this new guy comes in and he's trying to get his sea legs under him and figure out what's going on. And it introduces you to all of the core concepts of DevOps um, in a novel. I'm not going to say it's the most exciting novel in the world, but it's, I mean, I, I was to it in like two days on Audible and it was fine and it was fun. The sequel to that is a textbook called The DevOps Handbook. Um, I'm reading it right now. It's, it's fine. Uh, free podcast called Rested DevOps Podcast. I mean, if you're not doing podcasts for this, for whatever you're learning about right now, anyway, you're missing a really wonderful resource. Podcasts are great. You should be reading them or not reading, listening to them. But Arrested DevOps is probably the best DevOps podcast out there right now. And then, uh, yeah, come talk to me. Free within reason. Uh, yeah, email me, Clayton at Hang.Software, and that's it. Thanks, guys.